Sasha Freestyle. The chat will be around about half an hour, and then after the chat, there'll be about 15 20 minutes for questions. Please do give your questions. There's so much knowledge with these two that it will it will spark so much off, even though you don't think you will have questions. And sometimes the most basic questions, Lester Holloway over there, hello, how are you, sir? Um, are, are, are the ones that can provoke the most insightful answers. So please do engage, um, respond. There's a way too much knowledge next to me not to do that. I'll hand over to you then. special conversation with two very special, inspirational individuals, um, if a little cold. <laughs> um, Claire Hines is a lecturer in literature and creative writing at the University of East Anglia, where she also leads on decolonizing curriculum work across the Faculty of Arts and Humanities, a fiction, creative, non-fiction and theatre monologues have appeared in uh, what's a theory journal of international contemporary writing, the Bath Short Story Award Anthology, Lighthouse Itinerary Journal and Tangled Roots Anthology, among other publications. It's also won and been shortlisted for national awards. In 2022, uh, she you presented the BBC World Service documentary, My Granny the Slave, in connection with her research about an enslaved ancestor in Antigua. Uh, she previously worked as a BBC documentary filmmaker and as the news editor for black British newspaper, The Voice. Um, and her media work has won national creative industry awards, including a George Vinham Memorial Award for journalism, a CRE race in the media award, and a Royal Television Society Award. Welcome, Claire. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Jason Arde is a social commentator, presenter, and public speaker. He's currently the 2002 Professor Pro Professorial Chair of Education at the University of Cambridge, making him the youngest ever black academic to hold a professorship at Cambridge, and one of the youngest academics ever appointed to a professorial chair in Oxbridge's history. Now, the context to all of that is important um, because at three years old, Jason, as you, some of you may or may not know, was diagnosed with global development delay and autism spectrum disorder. He didn't speak until he was seven. He couldn't read or write until he was 18. And yet... He's held professorial posts at the universities of Glasgow and Durham. At Durham, he was also deputy executive dean for people and culture in the facility of social science and health. He holds an honorary professorship at Durham University and visiting professorships at the Ohio State University, the University of Glasgow and Mandela University. And all of this is important in the context of what we're going to discuss. So I'll just read you a little bit more. Jason's also a trustee of the Runnymede Trust, the UK's leading race equality think tank, and outside of academia, he has written regular, fe he has regularly written, featured, and spoken on issues of race and racism in education and society for the Guardian, the Times Higher Education Supplement, the BBC, ITV News, CNN, Good Morning America, and CBS. There is more, so so much more, but I think you may want to ask him about it rather than listen to me. So, welcome Jason. Now then, I did think about how best to approach this chat. Um, you can all see the uh, title on it, but I did, 
I thought to myself, a, a better way to approach it would be to make a statement. You two are two of the most inspirational people I know. So my first question is, with all that's going on, relating to race, society, everything, who inspires you? Claire? Who inspires me? Okay, that's a really great question. Um, so the writing that I'm doing at the moment is about a um, ancestor of mine, a woman ancestor, who was enslaved and ran away from a plantation and lived in a cave. And I think about how resilient this young woman was. She was only young, she was about 17. How creative she would have been, the amounts of strength and ingenuity to survive. So there's something about the history of black women that is really important to me. Um, my mother passed away a few years ago, but she was a really inspirational figure for me. Um, came over as part of the Windrush generation, worked as a nurse in the NHS, worked very hard, and um, helped me to feel really good about myself as a black woman. Um, yeah, and there are some just amazing women in my family, from the Antiguan side of my family. And I'm really interested in the idea of um, looking back through our mothers. So Virginia Woolf, who I've written about, uses this term in an essay called A Room of One's Own. And so part of my research and writing has been doing that, has been following that sort of idea. Who has gone before me? Who really inspires me? And writers as well, you know, modern day writers like Bernadine Evaristo, who's so amazing, does so much for black women. Um, a writer called Zora Neale Hurston, an African-American writer. She was someone who, you know, as a teenager growing up, surrounded by literature in which I wasn't reflected. And um, their eyes were watching God in particular and her other writing really inspired me. And her use of language, black language, her love of black culture, it filled me with a sense of power, and respect in terms of who I am and who's gone before me. Mm, and that's so important, isn't it, Jason, to be able to get that kind of inspiration that, that drives you and helps you to understand yourself. Who inspires you? Hugely, you know, and I think Claire points to some amazing people. Um, Claire herself is, is immensely inspiring, and I guess... I'm glad you said that. Yeah, hugely inspiring, um, as, as well as yourself. Um, and I had the privilege of watching you on TV in some way, shape or form, listening to you on radio for 20 years. So um, it's quite surreal to be sat here with you now. Um, to be honest, I, I'm always inspired by the mundane. Like, um, my, my dad always said to me, there's a beauty in the mundanity of life that you don't experience mm -hmm. when you're kind of wrapped up in the razzmatazz of what you would like life to be. So um, I was very fortunate to have experiences where I had not that long ago, probably eight years ago, cleaning jobs and working um, nights at Sainsbury's. Um, and the people that I was inspired by were the people who kind of would always say things to me like, remember Jason, you're very fortunate, out of necess necessity dictates that I have to do this for a living, but you have choices. And um, the one thing I never underestimated um, was how much courage it takes to get up every morning and to do something that you actually may not want to do. But because necessity dictates so, you have to do it. And um, there are so many people who do, who, the majority of people in the world we live in have to endure this reality. And um, my inspiration comes from them because it allows me to put things into perspective when I find work hard and realise that actually you wake up every day and you're doing, you're living the dream. Um, and hard work doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get what you deserve out of life. And so the other side of that is luck. And, and I've been very, very fortunate. And it's the same fortu fortuity and luck that has sat me in this position with you both tonight. Well, thank you for that. Because um, you. uh, you're right. You both are uh, very inspirational figures um, for many, many people. I'm going to go with one, if I'm, if I'm allowed. Um, because I, I'm going to mention Diane Abbott. I love the outpouring of support and emotion for her and her, 
statement that that support made. Um, and I kind of tend not to waste energy on the debates around whether what was said about her was racist or not, because I think we can all make up our own minds about that. Um, I did want to ask you, however, about how we go about, in our society, preserving that energy and making sure that we're at peace as we think about race and society. Claire? So, how we go about preserving the energy of someone yeah. like... That you would otherwise use to be drawn into culture wars and these debates about whether something that we all know to be excuse mm. me, racially offensive is can be described as such. How to preserve that energy. I think my, my view on that has changed over the years. Um, I think that through my work at the university teaching and wanting to support students and finding that students of colour in particular were um, feeling excluded and isolated and wanting to support them and really trying to have conversations about how we can best support students. Um, and so, and particularly, you know, we're talking about what's gone on since Black Lives Matter. So there's been a lot of discussion, obviously, since then. Um, and I think I kind of exhausted myself having lots of conversations about race with lots of people. And... Um, and I remember when René Edo Lodge's book came out, Why no, no Longer Speak to White People About Race. Um, and at the time, I, I felt as if I really disagreed with it. Um, I felt, well, it's important to speak out. It's important to have conversations. And how am I going to do my job properly if I'm not having these conversations? And while I say I am still having those conversations and they continue... I think there's a, there, your question is really interesting. There's, there's an element there in which I think now I'm thinking about, well, how do, I, how do I look after myself and how do I look after others within this? So it might mean thinking about, well, well when am I going to have these conversations? Is it worth having conversations with people who just don't want to hear? Mm. And, and if that's the case, that, you know, let me preserve my energy. So it's, it's about being more strategic, yes. I think, about who to have those conversations with, when to have those conversations. And the other thing is gaining, gaining support, you know, and feeling like because I, I uh, work at University of East Anglia, I'm in a, you know, quite a white space. Um, how, how do I... How do I ensure that I'm not isolated, yes. that I'm, I'm having to speak up? I feel like I'm having to speak up a lot. Um, so it's about trying to think about supportive environments and mm. connecting with others to be able to have those conversations. Because I know you both, and you're very, both very much about positivity and moving forward and being very selective about the way that you use that energy uh, to ensure that you aren't exhausting yourself emotionally as you try to cover ground that you've covered previously? How do you go about it, Jason? That's a good question. I mean, um, I think Claire's covered kind of a lot of the areas. It's, it's difficult. I, one of the things I always think about is, um, in some respects, as a black or an ethnic minority person, you're kind of trained in waiting your entire life with how to deal with these situations. And there's never a point where it arrives. It's always on the precipice of being there. So... One of the things that I've learned is um, it was taught to me quite a young age, but I remember my mum kind of having this big thing about giving people compassion when they least deserve it. And a lot of times you're f in the face of absolute provocation, you're faced with having to show tremendous restraint. Yes. And I think restraint is a very underrated quality. And I think black and ethnic minority people constantly, continuously have to show restraint. And in doing that, there is a process of internalization which obviously can make people ill but alongside that there's also a capacity to continuously forgive in the face of that provocation and it's something that I think people shouldn't take for granted and there is a, a physical and psychological toll that comes with that but for me it always comes back to that um, compassion to, to forgive and to provide opportunities um, 
to recenter how people think about certain things. Yes. Um, so it's not for me to tell people how to think, but it's for me to tell them what a reality is. And I don't think that um, if a person of colour tries to explain what their racist experience is, I don't think it's for anyone to contest. And I'm really experience. glad you say that because I, 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 I've certainly found myself getting to a point where um, the, my colour's not up for debate. Yeah. So there is never... I, I now no longer take part in, is he right? Yeah. <laughs> or is X or Y saying, yes, that is racist? It, are they right? It's, it's not a game show. You know, I'm, I'm like, <laughs> why am I doing this? Um, I do want to validate you, though, Dr. Claire, because as a black woman, um, <laughs> it must have felt for you hearing those words that were allegedly said in the same way that the George Floyd situation. I've never watched the video in its entirety. Shame on me, maybe, but I just can't go through that male trauma of seeing another man yeah. kicked. Um, and I'm sure it's the same for no, yourself same as well, I'm, Jason. I'm deliberately not watching it, yeah. So I just want to... And, and please, you don't... You absolutely don't have to cover that ground if you don't feel you want to. But just how, how did... How did the Frank Hester situation sit with you? Um, what I really like about the way that you framed that question was that you didn't repeat those comments. Mm. And I think part of the difficulty was to hear those comments repeated again and again through the yes. media, and sometimes framed in ways which didn't take issue with those comments or didn't, didn't do so sufficiently. So I think partly um, it wasn't that, you know, necessarily that this person said these words so much as how, how, how is this being discussed in society? Yes. How is this being played out? Um, I think, I think in some ways it's made me feel as if, you know, these, these big comments are made and similar to George Floyd, these, you know, there are these flashpoints in which there's, there's, you know, generally a kind of horror from, particularly from, you know, liberal people or people who, who are, you know, who, who are interested in questions of equality. Um, but perhaps a less of a recognition that, that those sentiments are part of life, you know, that these, these questions or these feelings are felt by me um, as I move through the world, that they don't have to be said explicitly. Um, so for me, it's, it's almost like, okay, this has come to the surface now. At, le at least we can see, we can see what it is. I, I know what it is. Um, yeah, it's awful, but this is this this is stuff. This is real. Mm. I've, I've, I've walked through spaces. I go through spaces, and I feel that hatred. I feel that hatred um, in terms of not because of who I am, but of what what I who, who I represent, or you know, being a black woman is is somehow not not something that that people feel. Um, it, you know, it's it's it's. It's not, it's not validated or supported, you know, yes. in, in lots of different ways. I mean, it, it, it might be in, you know, kind of we, we love Beyonce or whatever it is, but, but there, there is a, there's a lot of hate. Yes. Um, and that, you know, that, that's sad. It's not, it's not just sad for me or other black women. It's sad for society. Yes. Um, in a weird, perverse way, there is almost a, a, a validation that what, we have known to be the case, mm -hmm. suddenly was being played out in the public domain, mm -hmm. and suddenly people were getting that understanding of the kind of thing that had been said for so many years. Yeah. Jason? I think, I think the position... <laughs> I was the only one that didn't flinch, did you see that? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm deaf in one ear, that's what I think. Um, I was going to say, something that um, my mum has always said to me is that the position of black women in society is always permanently precarious. Yes. Um, and part of that permanent precarity normalises the trauma that is inflicted upon black women. It's just normalised. The people don't even flinch, really. Um, that's the concerning part that people just see it as normal discourse. They don't actively try and disrupt it. 
you know, you can have an apology, but not really an apology. Yes. Um, you can have consequences in play, but they don't really exist. Um, you know, you can have really even Keir Starmer not not really condemn the comments in its full entirety because at the current moment the whip's been taken off Diane Abbott and you know the, the, there's some of these things that are kind of quite difficult and yes there are reasons why the whip was taken off her but actually it's about thinking how do we demonise black women within society and part of it is it's kind of it's organ it's almost like an organised racket it, it's just it's so normalised what I find really disturbing is um, the fact that it's not disrupted through any form of legislation, policy, you know, um, societal commentary. People just don't disrupt it. But I know that you two, and I, this is going to be a theme throughout this evening, you are both very much about positivity. And one of the things I found to be very positive, uh, and we'll, we'll come back to this later on in the chat, but social media has disrupted it because social media has given rise to real power in the voices of the people who have pushed back, male and female, black and white, against what has transpired in relation to this. But also, in answer to the question, over the past four years, we've seen the rise of a number of platforms where black voices can feel empowered to push back against the orthodoxy and against situations just like this. And that must give you reasons for optimism. Yeah, I think that, that rear guard action, I, I think it's always existed through many, many forms, you know, through many civil, there's been many incarnations of civil rights, black civil rights activism, and there's always been a pushback, that pushback has always existed. I think what's happening now is that um, there's been a harping back to yesteryear where people have gone back to being unapologetic about it. You know, you can't kind of stifle, suppress those people in the ways that systems have have effectively done, but not really achieved, um, because those people's voices still chime and still ring true. And it'd be interesting to kind of hear what you both think on that as well, because I, I do think we, we always take our direction by what's happened before, but you can you can see almost people's chests swelling as they kind of provide that rearguard action to what they're confronted with, and that that in many ways is quite arousing, and it's, and it's seductive for a generation of people actually looking at that and thinking, I'm going to take my cue from those individuals. Yes. Claire? I think what I found really heartening was um, social media, or my social media, not that I do loads of social media. Um, Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, were filled with these um, videos of um, people I knew demonstrating outside Hackney Town Hall. Mm. And so and that wasn't something I, I, I um, received through mainstream media, but it was, it was huge. And, it, it, and it's very affirming. Um, so, yeah, you're, you're right that this idea of, of kind of galvanising people into action and, and really saying, that, you know, we're not taking this. And your point, Jason, about the way that that's happened through, throughout history, you know, we can think about, um, you know, Black Lives Matter and George Floyd, which is, you know, obviously really important. But, you know, there were so many um, flashpoints in history before that in which black people were pushing back, you know, from um, Stephen Lawrence, um, uh, you know, New Crossfire, sort of 1981. Olive Morris. Yeah, Olive Morris. Yeah, Bernie Grant. Yeah, Bernie Grant. <laughs> loads, loads, of, um, loads of examples of times in which black people have come together and, and really decided, no, this, this, this is enough mm. and we're, we're not accepting it. Um, if you're a, if you're a mum, if you're a parent, uh, how do you navigate this working landscape? Are we still telling our children that you've got to work twice as hard, or you've got to commit twice as much to whatever endeavour you are involved in, like our parents said to us? Um, I I think so. Yes. Really? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. My my mum definitely definitely said to me, you, you know, work twice as hard. That's what you need to do. That's, Twice that's as hard a, as somebody who is white. As someone who's white, um, told me that there are different rules. I remember her having a conversation with one, one of my brothers, saying, "Look, your white friends can go and smoke cannabis, and that you know that's okay. It's just high jinks. But if you do that, you know you'll be criminalised." So I, I was brought up, and I, and for me it was helpful to know that 
that's what it is. You know, it's an unfair system. It's an unfair society. Yes, we need to, you know, challenge it and take issue with it. But, you know, let's be real. That, that is what we're facing. And it's, it's sad, but that's, that's true. And the important aspect of this is that many people who are white have used social media and lots of big platforms to point out that discrepancy that you highlight and to recognise that there are different rules for different demographics. Jason? Yeah, I mean, it's always a shifting of sands or a shifting of goalposts. Um, my own daughter's 17 um, and my son's 9 and I always think about when's the time to have the chat. So I think my dad had the chat with me or my mum when I was, I, I think, about 13. What were you saying? It was basically... We got a lot of time, but... Yeah, no, I mean, the, the long and short of it was, if you ever get confronted by the police, like, soft shoulders, keep your hands down, speak with a soft tone of voice, and make sure your body language is soft, and don't move suddenly. Wow. Um, and, it, and it stayed with me my whole life. People always say you're really softly spoken, but that's <laughs> what I was told to do. It for your yeah. your so this is it. So um, I think it's 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 something that exists. And look, th there are a lot of black people, by the way, who work twice as hard to get half as much. Mm. So it's not even an exact science all the time that that ends up being the case. Um, and what Claire said about what her mother said to her brother. But my parents said exactly the same thing to me and my brother. There's so much so that I've never smoked, drank or done drugs for yeah. the reason that if I did do it, I feel like the, the consequence would be very different for me. Um, I always felt that, particularly as a teenager, as in when you get into kind of adulthood at 18 and also early 20s. And I, and I was always so cognizant of that because I would see my white counterparts getting themselves into strife with the police, but they'd, they'd be let off yeah. immediately and I'd, and I'd be stopped. And I'd kind of like, I don't even, I don't even drink. <laughs> so it's, yeah, so. I love that insight into yourself so I'm going to get into a little bit about the two of you because you did an interview a few days ago with Dr Claire um, you can call me Claire it's alright no oh. bells and whistles <laughs> necessary <laughs> yeah. ok, okay. Thank you. Um, but you have earned it thank you yeah. Yeah. Um, you were not going to be an academic were you oh um, which interview is this <laughs> not that there are that many <laughs> Um, I, yeah, I think, um, oh, there was absolutely no way I, I thought about being an academic. Absolutely no way. Um, I, um, I think we're a similar age, but yes. <laughs> this, uh, when, I was, <laughs> when I was growing up, you just, they, uh, you know, I remember, I remember a white uh, colleague asking me um, not so long ago, you know, what was school like for you? You know, and and just this realization. Oh, you didn't realize it was. It, you know, no one, no one had any sort of belief. You know, the the standards, the expectations were so low, um, and uh, you know, so the expectation was, you know, you leave at sixteen. You know, you you won't be going to university. People without even knowing how I was doing at school. You know, my careers teacher literally taking one look at me. And, and saying, you know, get out. So I, so I had this feeling that university wasn't wasn't for the likes of me. Um, I always loved writing. Got into the media, which in some ways felt more more open, even though it was it was difficult. Um, and um, and then in later life, went went to UEA and did an MA, did a PhD. And someone said to me, oh, um, would you ever become an academic? And I just laughed in their face. I thought, there's absolutely no way that's happening. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it's just, it, it just felt like it, it just wasn't, it wouldn't be on my radar. There was no one I saw around me who, who, who was, who was there. I mean, I had, um, I, I mentioned in this interview, the one I think you're referring to, uh, a friend of mine, um, Robert Beckford, who's a prominent black academic. But, uh, yeah, he's, he's fantastic and has, has really supported me. But outside of that, I didn't see people at my university. Mm. Um, so, so yeah, I, I'm just amazed that I'm here. I'm still like, oh, my gosh, so I'm, see, I'm Dr. Claire, am I? Absolutely, <laughs> really? but you yeah. should own it. And it's yeah. the reason why I, I refer to it as doctor, because yeah. the, the, it's not just academic work that has gone into that. <laughs> It's emotional, societal work that's gone into it, defying the odds. And when we talk about race in society, 
the difficulties that you have to surmount, the obstacles that you have to get past to be where you are. Is it true there is 61 black professors out of 26,000 across yeah, the 20, country? Yeah, out of 23,000. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so the, the, the numbers are really, really low. And the other thing is when we do have, um, you know, m many of those um, professors of colour uh, are coming from overseas. Um, so the fact that we're, you know, we're black British academics, I think, is, is pretty, pretty fantastic. But yeah, we definitely need more black women um, coming into academia. Jason? Yeah, I mean... Follow that. No, I, I, don't, I don't intend to. I'm about to... Claire's brilliant. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's... 24,000 professors, um, the number is 210 black professors, 61 are black women. Um, yeah, um, black women outnumber black men in the academy by two to one. So, you know, there's some brilliant research that's been done um, around the lost 300. So it's the 300 black women that should have been mm. black female professors and how they've been denied, which is why, you know, we really need to continue to interrogate these structures because what we can't continue to the, the, the academy is not blessed with you know abundance and abundance of kind of uh, amazing black academics and the reason why I say that is because there's so many obstacles in place for them to even get there in the first place yeah. so the ones that we do have it's really important that we find ways to ensure that they end up where they need to be because there are too many people that have fallen by the wayside through systemic and institutional kind of through the apparatus of systemic and institutional racism which is which I, I've been unapologetic about saying, and that's always been the case, especially for black women in the academy. So I think that's something that we kind of really need, or at least in my work I'll continue to address, but we, we do need to address that. Uh, I, I wasn't going to ask this, and I know we don't have a lot of time. Where's Mandy? Is Mandy in the, how long do I have, Mandy? Five minutes? Anyone want ten minutes, fifteen minutes, or do you can five, ten minutes? Just a little bit more time. I'll, I'll, take, I'll be very quick with this one, but very often uh, one of the things I find people say is this is the way we've always done it. And so it's not necessarily sinister or what we would characterise as racist, but they would just say it's the way things have always been done. Do you think there is that complacency or do you think that um, there is... We live in a real world, and in some, at some level, there is a willingness to uphold the structure, as we put it. But what are your thoughts around that? And I, I, either of you can take that one. I, I understand the idea when you don't know better, you don't do better. Yes. But I, I think when you do know better, it becomes a choice. And I think far too often, people actually do know better, and they make a concerted choice to not do the right thing. Mm. And I think as a society, we, we would do better to actually interrogate why people choose to make that choice. Of course, free will allows individuals to do what they like, but I think free will at the expense of the humanity of another individual needs to be questioned and needs to be challenged. And all too often, I think we've, we've assimilated in, into this culture where it's okay to oppress particular minority groups without challenge, and, and, and that, I find that staggering. Um, well, I was thinking about the question in, re in relation to um, universities, um, this idea that, okay, there's a particular tradition, there's a particular way of doing things. Um, and, um, and sometimes uh, the idea of kind of diversity is pitted against sort of educational excellence. But part of teaching excellence is about um, changing, changing styles, approaches, content. So we don't teach in the way that we did a hundred years ago. You know, we don't necessarily have everything as being kind of, you know, we're the experts, we're just kind of going to force it on you. You remember things and, and tell it back to us and write an essay. Yes. It's discursive, there are different ways of doing things, different ways of engaging pe people, um, you know, you sort of creative methods, so, so the ch ways in which we teach have changed, but the content needs to change 
as well. You know, so there are different views, different perspectives, different ideas. Um, so, and if, if we stay, if we stay, if we do things exactly the same, oh, the same way, it, ju it just makes it, nothing in society stays the same. Not fashion, not music, not food, everything, everything moves on. And, um, uh, you know, but, there, but it's interesting that in certain spaces or certain spheres, there's, a, there's that kind of resistance. And that, that's a really good point because obviously I, I work in journalism and I, I see certain areas of, of, of my industry characterise that move to want to progress and to learn more and widen the sphere of learning in terms of decolonising the curriculum as something to be derided rather than to be embraced in the same way as you say we would develop music we would develop art we would develop so many other areas of society um, and so when somebody talks about wanting to do that with the curriculum it's characterized as a threat to the curriculum rather than an opportunity for so many students watching this who are here who aren't here but watching on on on, on, the, on online will be able to benefit from what are your views on that? I always kind of go back to what the purpose of education is, which is, for me, it's always been about this values and belief system around preparing people to take their place within society. And as custodians of educational spaces, part of that responsibility is to provide people the toolkit to navigate a multicultural, multi-ethnic society. And I think all too often in education, I, I often question how well are we equipping people to go back into society, to go into society, to be able to navigate a multicultural, multi-ethnic society. And I think that always has to be the premise, because fundamentally, being able to navigate a society like this requires huge level of diplomacy, it requires an accepting of difference, it requires an accepting that actually people experience kind of intersectional inequalities and what might that look like it requires us to kind of sit in an empathetic space you know to kind of stand or at least yeah stand alongside people in capacities of allyship whatever that may be across the intersectional spectrum so i think those things are important and i think it is really important particularly with race because there is a normalization with racism and a nostalgia about how things used to be um and almost this kind of, I don't know, like this, this kind of colonial amnesia. And if you're not colonially compliant, then the next thing that accompanies that is, well, if you don't like it, you can leave. And I, and I think it's, it's important we, we're better than that. Yes. We're better than that. And I, and I think we need to move beyond that. Because actually, it's to everyone's advantage to understand that actually the best way to navigate difference is to have an understanding of where we've come from, where we've been, and that allows us to think about where we're going. Absolutely. And in an interconnected world now, as the digital media allows us to be, there is an even greater emphasis on needing to have that understanding. Claire? Yeah. Um, yeah, we definitely need, we need to have that we need to have that understanding. And I think the interesting thing when, with the conversations around decolonizing the curriculum was, um, was that the, the impetus was coming from the students themselves who were feeling shortchanged by their education because, um, you know, this idea that there are expected ways in which we, we think about subjects. Um, and, um, yeah, there might be, I mean, within literature, creative writing, there are some, you know, obviously great canonical writers. And no one's saying get rid of the canon. No. It's just that there are fantastic writers outside of the canon. And surely we should also be, you know, in including them and thinking about new perspectives, new ways of looking at the world. So, no, so that, but it, 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 the discussion around it was so, has been so misguided and frankly bizarre um you know and it makes you for me i'm thinking well why you know what what is it what, what is this terror about kind of oh well you know we'll never we'll never you know shakespeare's going to be thrown out of the window and trashed or something for some you know bizarre black writer i mean it's just that's that's not what's happening uh, line your questions up i've only got a couple more for 
uh, Claire and for Jason's, and then I'll be handing over to you to ask your questions. Um, I live in London. Dr. Claire, you live uh, in East Anglia. Mm -hmm. And you're in London as well, aren't you, Jason? Awesome percent. Yes. <laughs> awesome percent. Um, does your understanding of racism depend on where in the country you live? In 2024. I think so. Um, and this is actually working here is the closest I've worked to home, which is London, um, South, Clapham, South London. And I worked at several different um, places um, in the north, um, and including Scotland. And I think understandings around race are completely different, based one on diaspora and populace. So the further up north I went, the smaller percentage of, of black and ethnic minority people there were. So I worked at Durham for three years, for example, and in the northeast, 98% um, of the northeast is, is, is white. So it's, it's a very small populace of, of black or ethnic minority people there. So understandings around that in some respects are still quite embryonic. Um, but there was a willingness um, for people to kind of learn more in terms of what that may have looked like, because obviously what what the Northeast was populated by was um, five institutions, and two in particular at the University of Sunderland and Teesside University and Northumbria, sorry, three that had huge kind of um, South Asian populaces at those um, institutions. So people are beginning to understand a bit more about what that was like and how that transpired. Um, and what I would say is that being spoiled, you know, when you're brought up in London, you're spoiled in some respects. Um, and I hadn't appreciated that until I worked in Liverpool, Leeds, Durham, Scotland, or Glasgow to be specific. Um, and it, it, it is different. It is very different. Um, but what what is interesting is... You go to a place like Liverpool, for example, that has this rich, incredible history, um, not just for the sport, but it was also um, a, a port, a, 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 a colonial outport. And how they engage with that history, there's always been a tension around how yes. they engage with that history. Um, but then you go to kind of LA and you meet people within those areas and you learn more about kind of what the kind of tox death riots meant and how it kind of simulated across yes. the UK at the time, you know, in terms of in the Midlands, you know, in, in Tottenham, in Brixton, etc. So it, it is different, but what's really interesting in all of these places is that everyone has their unique story to tell about how they've negotiated or navigated race and racism and yes. kind of diaspora in those spaces. And in some respects, it's... Um, it's hugely inspiring, but it does always make me feel very grateful that at a time when my parents first came to the UK, as a black person, as an immigrant, you didn't have a choice about where you where you were placed. And, and I grew up on a council estate, and I'm very aware that I could have been moved to any I could have been moved to parts unknown. And it's it's but for the grace of God that I was very fortunate. My, we not only did we we were brought up in London, but we stayed in London when actually at times. You know, that wasn't always necessarily going to be the case because in the mid-90s, black families were being moved all over oh, the UK. Claire? Um, so, well, as you noted, I, I live in East Anglia, um, Norwich. And um, so, yeah, experiences of racism are different there. I think when I first moved to Norwich, I moved to um, do my MA um, quite a while ago. And I remember going onto the campus and, and seeing one black student way in the distance and going up to him and saying, where are all the black people? <laughs> and he said, oh, there are 20 of us. And I was like, oh, dear. <laughs> um, so, um, so, yeah, it, it, was a, it felt like an iso quite an isolating experience. And um, I remember my first trip, so I'd feel the need to just keep getting back to London. And I would, um, I, I, I remember driving down to London and filling up the boot of my car with kind of plantains and sweet potatoes <laughs> and hair products and, and like feeling okay, I need to surround, my, surround myself with this stuff. Because? Um, because, because it was like that. This is my sort of comfort. This is this is making me feel more like you know, more kind of at home. Yes. 
Um, and, um, and I got involved with sort of Black History Month in, in Norfolk, and I remember feeling, uh, wow, it feels like, this feels like London 20 years ago. But um, there is, you know, there's a, a, there is a small but growing, you know, kind of multicultural community. And, um, and I think things have changed over the years. There's a, there's a Black History Month tour in, in Norwich, which is amazing, which debunks that idea about Norwich being this sort of white city. Um, you know, black people have been coming in and out of Norwich for, you know, centuries. There's a, there was a, a famous Victorian circus owner called Pablo Fanke who lived, in, who lived in Norwich. And there's a student building that, um, that has been named after him. So, so it's about, you know, let's change, change up the kind of narratives. Before it was Nelson, you know, it, everything's like Norfolk. It's Nelson's County, Nelson, Nelson, Nelson Street, Nelson Pub, Nelson everything, which was a bit sort of strange for me because then I go back to, you know, go to Antigua. I shouldn't say go back. I wasn't born there. Mm. But I go to Antigua, which I do often, and the whole, there's a whole south part of the island is, is sort of Nelson's dockyard. <laughs> So I'm like, gosh, I can't get away from this Nelson guy. He's everywhere. So, um, so yeah, things have th things have changed. But I do, I do feel the need to. I go to London regularly. Um, I visit. I've got really great family in Antigua, and so, and, and the, although I'm born and raised in this country, I feel as if um, Antigua is is another home for me in London. So, I keep myself healthy and, set, and, and feeling good. Yeah. Well, I've got so many more questions around race, pay, cab, diversity, whatever else, but I do want to take questions. I will give particular uh, prominence and priority to anyone who's called Nelson. <laughs> uh, but I'll start over here. I think this is compulsory. Um, I'm intrigued to know what, how you respond to the fact that our government as a number of very senior people of colour. Who would you like to give that question to? Oh. The panel? Okay, who would like to take that one? Me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, uh, how do I feel about that? That's, um, it's an interesting one. I mean, well, how, do you make sense of it? how do I make sense of it? Okay, I'd make sense of it by saying this, that we need to think about not just the individuals. People are saying, well, how, how can... How can people who are brown be saying that diversity is, is wrong? How can they be so quick to say that, you know, racism doesn't exist? But we need to think about the systems and structures. It's, these aren't, uh, this isn't about individuals. This is about society, and this is about um, systems and structures and um, the legacy of colonialism that has meant that, the, you know, these ideas are in place. And also that, interestingly, all these ideas about, oh, well, you know, diversity and some people are getting advantages. I mean, there was an interesting article in The Guardian that was saying, well, if, if anyone's doing well out of, out of, you know, pushing certain politics which are anti-equality and anti-diversity, it's certain, you know, brown people in, in polit high political places you know how how well are they how well are they doing it you know it's better not to get certain people to um it's the better perhaps for some people to think okay well you know we don't have to some white people don't need to speak up about these things because others will i've probably said too much now i probably shouldn't have, <laughs> i should have let you no, take no, it no, no, no. I've got you, I've got you. Help me out, help me out. I think part of the problem is that um, it, it reminds me of something my dad said, like the only concept that is colorblind is individualism and selfishness. And I don't think we should confuse um, individualistic base desire over representation. I think that's a very important thing because... A lot of um, the parliamentarians of colour that currently reside, they are really being used as mules to push agendas that really don't benefit um, the greater good. So, for example, when you have parliamentarians who are, you know, rubbishing things, for example, like critical race theory, 
or um, saying diversity or kind of associating this with a woke agenda, um, the cost for them to say that, the cost to them, I guess when they weigh it up, is minimal in respect to what they may gain politically and career, from a career point of view speaking, in terms of the trajectory they face. So I, I often tell people, when I'm, I've heard questions like this before, and one of the things I always emphasise to people is that, you know, we shouldn't align naked, aggressive ambition with mobilising the agenda of race equality because they're two different things and that kind of animal instinct that some people have um, where they're happy to exploit agendas to further their own cause is really not exclusive to black or brown parliamentarians it's it's something that actually happens in politics full stop um, as we've seen Boris Johnson do to brilliant effect with the um, with the referendum campaign around uh, the Europe around Brexit. Can I just ask you before we move on, what's your view on the question that you've just asked? Um, I think it's a terrible situation. If you'd have asked me, bearing in mind I'm now in my 70s, if you'd have asked me 30 years ago which political party would have senior people of colour leading the government, I would have never have anticipated that. So I think it's important not to underestimate the mechanisms and priorities and manipulations of the Conservative Party as an institution. I think there are wider structures and completely sympathetic to that. But um, they're quite clever. <laughs> you know, well, the, 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 I asked for your opinion because the person who the microphone's going to go next to is the editor of the biggest black newspaper in the country. I was. Um, I was. Not anymore. I'm actually uh, here now in Cambridge uh, University. Okay. Um, but um, actually, just to respond to, to that, that last point, this is not my question. Um, I mean, I think that the, the fact that we have uh, so many uh, black and Asian uh, people who are pushing a very negative um, narratives around race equality that are finding every opportunity uh, they can possibly um, have to, to actually hit back uh, against people who are pushing for uh, racial justice is actually in some ways a badge of honour and a recognition of the fact that social media in particular and you know the Black Lives Matter movement uh, and everything that's going with it and that uh, uh, you know sense of um, you know, looking back into to history uh, and you know recognising the, the the history of Britain and you know and how Britain has, has you know benefited and got rich uh, by colonialism and, and slavery, you know those are very live things that are happening on the ground, and then you have a counter reaction. So in some ways, I think we should actually you know recognise actually that this is. N not a, a sign of success, but actually a sign of contest, really. But my, my question was actually about um, uh, academia um, and the fact that we have so many, uh, uh, so, so few uh, black professors and, and black academics uh, in, in general. Uh, and I guess my question really is, is about the fact that it feels like there's a real dichotomy between um, you know, people who really uh, in, you know, embrace, uh, you know, um, Diversity, sort of quote unquote, you know, when it's when there's no cost, uh, when when it's a case of um, you know embracing, you know, uh, or even teaching, um, you know, anti, uh, you know, co colonial, um, uh, you know, sort of texts and things like that, um, and there's a dichotomy between that um, and and actually listening to black academics and being challenged. Um, uh, by them, and, and that you know is a very uncomfortable situation. It just feels like sometimes they can coexist together, uh, well, and so in that situation, how do we actually break through and, and make a change there? So, 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 just the, the, the question: what, what, what is the actual question? Uh, yeah, how, what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> what do we do? What do we do about that? So, so the, the context of that question, uh, did, did, did you pick it up? Do you want to pick, it, pick it up? Great to see you, Mr. Um, so in, I think in terms of diversity and diversity in the kind of lecture space or the classroom, the educative space, I think one of the things that's um, 
that's difficult is that I think for a lot of black academics in those spaces, um, there is a hyper-surveillance already there. So a lot of the things that they want to discuss, um, that there is a policing of that, which happens um, through colleagues micromanaging the content and what is discussed. And it also happens subliminally through what students think and say. And sometimes students, you know, it, it can be the tail that waggles the dog the tail that waggles the dog and you've you've got this situation where students can make the lives of black academics in particular very very difficult particularly black women um and so in those spaces what do you mean by that sorry Jess. so very often if um students are disgruntled with what they are experiencing from a pedagogical point of view they have um they can provide scores at the end of modules and these scores are quite consequential for promotion um, or being considered for promotion. And a lot of the research I've done is that out of this process, black women are the most negatively affected by that. And a lot of it comes from people who, who take umbrage with not wanting to discuss, for example, issues around black feminism mm -hmm. um, as a theoretical construct or some of the kind of really tentative issues around racism, which there's a fragility that people experience in that environment. And as a result, the uncomfortability then kind of results in people being, actually, I didn't enjoy that pedagogical experience. That, the only reason I'm interrupting is because, Claire, you're nodding. So mm -hmm. I, maybe you want to pick up from what Jason's saying. Um, yeah, it's, it's a, that's a tricky one. So um, I, I do feel as if I have... I'm not just saying because I'm uh, employed by UEA, I'm not going to say, oh, it's, it's all, it's, you, you know, I'm not going to speak them up just because I'm employed by them. But I do feel like the, um, I feel supported by my head of school. I feel supported by quite a few people and that hasn't always been the case. So I think it, it helps, it helps to have support there. Yes. And, um, and there is, yeah, as Jason said, I'm, I'm, I'm always aware of that. I'm always aware that, that sometimes, um, sometimes, you know, you can feel resistance yes. or that there are uh, particular questions that, that people are asking you that they probably wouldn't be asking of your colleagues. And, um, and that, I mean, it's going back, it's similar to that question about... Um, about having to try twice as hard. It's like, well, that, that's, that's the terrain we're, we're working with. And it, and it is difficult and it does pose difficulties. Um, and all we can do is the best we can and feel that we're, we're supported by our colleagues. But, but we, do, we do have to bear in mind, you know, who's in the room and what, what are they asking of us? And, and, and you know, where, you know, where, where is this guy? It, it is a difficult situation, but, but it's, it's about finding ways in which to navigate it as, as effectively as possible. I've got a feeling that the feedback from here is going to be particularly positive. We've got another question over here. We've got one over there as well. Do we have time? Thank you. We'll go to on the left here. Oh, we've got a third one over there, but we'll go to on the left here if we can. We'll keep our answers to these ones tight so we can get everybody in. Thank you so much for this opportunity. My name is Esther from Kenya. Uh, mine is really a concern that translates into a question. Uh, trying to understand with all this knowledge that is out here about understanding the continuous acceptance of the black uh, society, especially as for Africa, into a subordinate position in anything development, global finance, in the academias are aware of it, even since 1881, it's been written. Walter Rodney has also wrote about it, Mazrui and everybody else, and currently a lot of contemporary scholars are writing about it. Then why is it with all this knowledge? Are we still signing or getting into parts uh, that are actually putting us into subordinate positions in terms of getting our financial advice getting financial aid and vis-a-vis -vis checking on what is happening on the other side of capital flight, uh, multinational corporations acting as looting machines. Why, why are we not concerned enough to get out of that uh, situation that brings everyday inequality 
somewhere in Africa, somewhere in Kenya, in Nairobi, and not so many people are able to come here and voice their concerns. Thank you. It's a good question. It's probably a thesis. I'm going to try and get an answer from one of you, maybe in about 30 seconds to a minute. Do you want to take that, Claire? Yeah, fine. fine. I mean, I can only really speak in terms of my discipline, in terms of teaching literature and creative writing, and say, although, um, uh, you know, it's about trying to, what I try to do is just um, expose my students to a wide range of texts, and African writers are part of that, you know, Ngugu Wa Thiongo or, um, you know, who, whoever it is, ju just, um, just a broad range of texts and, and also different, different perspectives as well. I'm teaching a feminist writing class and, um, you know, there's an idea of feminism as being kind of very white and European, but thinking about, you know, what are the experiences of African women? Um, let's look at African feminisms. Like there, there are lots of different ways in which we can explore the richness of African culture and African knowledge, African philosophy. And um, so I try to do that as, as much as I can, and I, I think that we should, and you're right. We, we, we're just not including enough, enough, enough of this ama you know, amazing knowledge that, that is in the world. It's been disparaged for so long, and it's important that we, we take it on. Right, let's take our questioner over here on the right. I know we've got a couple more. Thank you for all of your questions so far. Go ahead. Hi. Well, I'd firstly like to say thank you so much. It's been really inspiring just hearing you speak. Um, from my experience, I have, with every institution I've either studied in or worked in, I have always experienced some kind of racism. And I was just kind of wondering what your experiences were and if you feel like it's necessary to kind of sacrifice defending yourself in, to reach positions of success? That's a great question. Um, no, I, I think there's a cost and it's a, it's a residual one. I, I think um, what goes out, what goes in must come out. So if, you know, you can't, it's a difficult thing to suppress over a period of time. But um, I am a really big believer in terms of dignity and how one carries themselves. And it's difficult, and that's what I was talking about earlier, about restraint. I think um, the thing that we don't have the luxury of, of not being is we, we're always racially ascribed. And with those racial ascriptions, there's a set of stereotypes and ascriptions that come with that. So, for example, the angry black woman or the aggressive black male. Like, you just, if I want to be angry, it, I can't really afford to do it in the workplace, which is... Can I ask you, if that's the case, because I, I agree with you, you know, we're all in senior positions... Mm -hmm. But, but you're right, there is that cost that comes with that. Sometimes we might want to express ourselves and we think, well, if we do, we jeopardise our space, we risk our space. But there is a cost to that, and it's an emotional cost because you do withhold it. There is a high rate of mental health issues, yes, particularly with black men. So is it still the case that we should exercise that restraint in your opinion or do we need to now that we have that awareness yeah, I address guess it differently when I, when I say restraint I, I think there's the initial ah oh! <laughs> like um, and, and, and I guess what you what you learn to do is kind of think right how can I get my point across um, recognising that there are all these kind of permutations in terms of how I how I pr how I place this point or how I verbalise this point and I think that people should always feel the need to be able to do that um, but unfortunately there is a dance you have to do and you have to self-censor in some ways but I think there's a way to do it I, I think, I would say this but I think we're, we're very magnificent and we've found ways of circumnavigating these situations since time memorial so there are ways to do it um, and I think there's a quiet authority and dignity that black and ethnic minority people have that actually they're not given the opportunity to tap into enough because they're racially ascribed so quickly before they even say anything. But I always think there's the opportunity to tap into that quiet authority. And I can stay like this and I can say something quite profound in terms of making a very a point that could cause a lot of friction in terms of something I disagree with at work. And there's not really anything someone could level at me. I've not been aggressive, I've not raised my voice, 
body language has stayed exactly the same. And these are all things that we shouldn't have to do because my white counterparts are allowed to be expressive and angry and flamboyant and it's kind of seen as like, oh, they've got a zest for life or, you know, if I do it, I'm combative or I'm angry. But I, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a quiet authority that we've always exercised. And, you know, when I think of people like Angela Davis or I think of bell hooks and people like people that I've always taken my direction from, they've always had that same sense of quiet authority. And it's, it's, it's a really powerful thing and something that we, we have to utilise in these difficult times. Claire, just pick up on that, because obviously mm. uh, there are lots of young black women who look at somebody in the position that you are in, and that's mm. a burden that you have to carry, mm. even at some times when you do want to smack your fist, as Jason just did. Mm. Um, so just answer that question very quickly. Um, well, I, I agree with Jason, and I think, I think, I don't, I f like to feel like I have a certain amount of integrity, that I'm myself, but I know that I need to present myself in a particular way, and I think that's something that I've learned growing up, that, that you, you know, you have to be super polite, you have to be super calm, and in some ways that feels kind of natural to me, but I don't think you have to compromise you know, the fact that we're even talking about race, I think, I, I think could be seen as, for some people, problematic. Some, some, of, some colleagues, um, colleagues of colour, don't even want to talk about race. So, so there, there is a certain amount of, of kind of, you know, weighing things up. But I, 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 think, I think you can do it. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've got one question over on the right side, then we'll take the question over Sorry. on the back. But first, this one over here. We will get to you. Are you, are you, are you okay to get to my next? Sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, Forty plus years ago, I was lucky enough to attend an amazing school to, called Ackland Burley in North London, a very diverse school. Um, we, my parents were on the march where Blair Peach was killed. Every Friday, I stood outside South African Embassy and we marched on the BMP bookshop in South London to, to close it in very scary circumstances. And some of the rhetoric I hear now really, really saddens me in terms of what, what, what's coming. If I look up on the screen in terms of the word progress, where it says about making real progress, and I know this is probably not a question for 10 past 9, but <laughs> if you had that, that ability to say to those people who could make that progress, what, what do we need to do now? Because 40 plus years on from where my family and I did those things and those actions, I don't think the progress in Quiet Valley has been as fast as we would like to, to have been. But if you had that ability to say, you know, where do we need to go next? What do we need to do to make that progress happen quicker? Um, I think we need to, I, th I think that the spirit that you talked about, which is about using our voices and, and making it clear what we're not happy with as a society coming together is, is really important. Um, I think that we should use our consumer power and, and decide, okay, if, if um, you know, if, uh, if certain newspapers are being really obnoxious, don't buy them. You know, if certain people don't want to employ black people or say nasty things about black people, don't, don't you know, don't support them. Um, and the other thing I think that's come out recently is uh, after, after Black Lives Matter, people were saying, oh, you know, what do I do now? And I think... What I'd like to see is more white people support, you know, there was lots of talk about allyship and that idea about, you know, anti-racism means proactive, you know, it's about proactive support. And I know that there are lots of people who are, who are supportive and, you know, many of you here, I'm sure, are really supportive. And I'd like to see, you know, things like we had that conversation about parenting and the talk you know, to what extent are white parents having their talk with their children about, you know, what society looks like. You know, um, I'd like to see that, you know, when my daughter's at school and she's experiencing racism, that her friends are, are you know, vigorously saying, this isn't okay. Yes. But at the moment, there seems to be this sort of, people are scared to talk um, and the far right is, is making use of that, you know, that there, there's a fear about, oh, well, if I say this, maybe it'll be the wrong thing, maybe I've um, used the wrong terminology. No, it's speak out and be supportive, and that will help to, to make changes. Now, I, I'm, I'm going to give you a choice. Do you want to answer that question, or do you want to take the next one? Uh, take the next one, so okay. that we get everyone in. All right, let's take that one over there on the far right, and then we'll come back to the far left. On the far right and the far left. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, go ahead. Sorry, just a bit 
louder, just to get that microphone closer to you. I was going to say there are few people here, and I hope that means that most people feel that there isn't a problem out there. Because the things that have brought out people onto the street and where there are placards are obscene things that have happened. And I think most of the population feels that the people that they are and that they live around, that that would never be part of their lives. Most people are good. I think there is a problem here in actually recognizing that we all range from pale pink to very deep pink. And we need to perhaps move forward into the future with different terminology so that we are not separated. There is just a diffusion of color, really, that exists. Um, we need to, you actually attended some of these um, BNF parades that I was too afraid to go to. And I remember saying to my parents, all the white guys are there and we're the only people who are not turning up because we're just too afraid. And the things that we do need to do is one thing that I really found valuable from the entire evening is, uh, are these few words that your father said to you when you were young, when it came to presenting yourself before any policeman or any figure of authority? And that is something that I think can be said in school assemblies all over the country, just so that other people and other young people have an idea of what your life experience is like. Because racism only exists because other people don't know how it feels to experience a different reality. There is so much perfect rhetoric out there. All the legislation is worded perfectly, but there is such a thing as a Garrett Club. And most of those individuals are not sitting here today. I wish they'd turned up. The Cambridge Union needs to have further debates about with, with titles that are a lot more provocative than, than this. Institutionalism racism exists within the criminal justice system, which makes it a failure. It ab absolutely, we have a very genteel conversation here today, and all these people are lovely. In fact, these are the converts. These are not the people that we need to be speaking with. The press is utterly, irredeemably irresponsible with the way that it is actually constructing itself. You were too polite, I, I do have to say. And I think that maybe there is space here for a Malcolm X discussion. Well, I, I, do you know, than, uh, it's a really good point. It's a really good point about really, the... Because I think I had a point. I wanted to finish with I presented um, a, a recorded a hate crime with regard to me, the police. And I want to tell you all what's happened. I uh, filled on the online form. Yeah, I got a perfectly nice email saying that this is your reference number, and uh, the reports are very important to me, which is exactly what you would expect if you lived in the room. And here's the telephone number that you need. Within seven days. So I don't know what they imagine, that if somebody called on the eighth day, nothing would be done. Well, for seven days, nobody picked up the phone. I then went to the police station, which is the Alapiti, which is outside police headquarters. And I spoke with somebody before the station had because the station now only opens for a few hours. And um, had a discussion, and nothing has happened since. And I said a few words about how important this was. But before I went to Parkside, I actually wrote to the MP, Mr. Anthony Brown. Three emails went by, and his secretary responded to me, what would you... Could you please summarize three times in three emails what you would like Mr. Brown to do or what you hope to achieve? And I think that was the point at which I said there's really nothing more that I can do. Well, I didn't actually give up. I actually wrote back an email saying I'll come up with a summary <laughs> and maybe I will. But it fills me with despair. And this is in a month in which Diane Abbott has been, yeah. has, has had an appalling time, and the voices have been mute. It's beyond what is acceptable. And the frustration that you expressed right there. There is we, another... We were speaking about it earlier in terms of the voices that have 
been empowered in this month, physically going to the town hall and being able to show that vocal support, but also using the different forms of media to be able to do that. And when we have these conversations here, they're designed to find a way through because we've grown up in decades of anger and frustration and the unwillingness or the inability to be able to express that anger that you expressed right there. So what we then have to do, for, just forgive me, um, is then find strategies and ways to empower ourselves so that we can go forward and actually subvert the structures that are intent on making sure that we don't have a voice. Please, go ahead. that happened two days ago. In London Bridge, I was walking um, in, a, in a small supermarket and um, a young white man, uh, he must have been his, in between 20 and 30, came into the store and he'd been drinking rather a lot. And he had picked up two bars of chocolate and uh, he suddenly turned to the security man and he said, why are you looking at me? Why are you looking at me? Which was, I can, I felt, well, that's a perfectly reasonable question to ask. You can feel upset that he's looking at you. And uh, the security man, who happened to be completely brown, uh, looked at him and didn't say anything, uh, but he was there. And another brown assistant who was in the store came up. So there are now two brown people and there's me standing there. And uh, the white guy came up and he said, you know, it would be different if it was you. What do you think? Would you be, would you be doing this if I was black? And uh, he was absolutely right in feeling that. He came from his heart. And I stood in between the security guy and him and he'd thrown the two bars onto the ground, this, and it, in a really aggressive way. And I remember thinking that I've seen this before, in another time, in another space, because I'm now 60, when the security man would have absolutely wielded the, the, the guy out through the shops, and it would all have been finished. But he turned to me and said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm trying to save you. And he was shaken and he said, what do you mean? And I just thought that this could so suddenly get ugly where the police are called and he would be in trouble. And all I had to do was to stop that from happening. It, it hurt me to think that he might get into trouble for feeling what he was feeling with all his heart. And part of this debate that I came to today, because I'm exhausted, I've been awake since four this morning, is that I want to say that there is real fear among people. It isn't just the one side when people say we don't want the woke agenda, which is perfectly valid and reasonable. That there is another side of humanity which doesn't understand why there is a need for world yes. discussion. And well, please excuse me, everybody, for taking... That's quite all right. This is much. not, as you it's rightly good. say, a genteel discussion. This is a real issue that affects lives, affects all of our day-to-day -day lives. Hopefully, we can get you guys back here because, I mean, an hour and a half is clearly nowhere near enough to be able to discuss something that really does stir up a lot of passion for a lot of people. So your thank contribution thank you is to the union. Thank you very much. <laughs> We'll take one more on the left over here. Thank, thank you for all of your questions, by the way. Uh, go ahead. Thank you very much, and thank you so much for your honesty and in, and in sharing what you have this evening. Um, my, my question is, is really related to um, uh, what can, as always, what else can be done to readdress balance, and, and particularly around narrative. Um, and so... Um, um, th that's where the question's going, <laughs> um, and, and education in particular. Um, and um, the, the point that I would like to raise uh, is very much um, about um, 
what, what has been taught across generations in terms of, of history. And obviously some of those things are being addressed. But now, um, you know, I, I, I sort of... Um, as a mature person, <laughs> I have only recently discovered, um, so I'm not alone is what I'm saying, I've only recently discovered that there, were in, there, there are incredible amounts of history, actually, that, that have never been told, and therefore, you know, we're unable to celebrate um, the tremendous works, you know, and I think of, of musicians, um, um, classical um, musicians, classical writing, classical music writing, that has never, ever been, um, you know, it's just not taught, um, you know, um, from, um, you know, people of colour, that have been written by people of colour, has never, ever been taught. So, um, you know, as a society, we lack richness, <laughs> in, in, because, you know, we don't, we don't know what has existed, we don't know um, uh, we're unable to celebrate it because we don't know it existed. Who do you want to direct that to? Um, so, um, I, um, culture. Uh, well, both, actually, because I'd like to hear what you both would have to say on okay. that. But in terms of education, thinking about future generations, how can that be addressed? Well, I think, I think we are, as a society, starting to address that. I went to a classical music concert the other day um, UEA Orchestra, and they were playing an African-American composer called Florence Price, and um, who, who has been, who, who is a composer who, who just wasn't celebrated in the past. And um, I went to an exhibition of uh, an artist called Frank Walter, a, um, again from, well, from Antigua, so, um, and he was a really prolific artist. Um, who, who wasn't celebrated in the past, but now they're, you, you know, just last year there was an exhibition in London. So I think we are, we, are, we are doing that work. Artists, writers are doing that work. I'm trying to do that work in telling the story of, of my ancestor and also other black women from the past. It's really important work. It's rich work. And as you said, it, it supports society. It supports education. Um, but yeah, I, I think you know that's something. And also, these are there are opportunities here for academics, for writers, for uh, you know to, to restore and recover these uh, you know great people from the past. Jason, do you want to take the last word? Yeah, I was going to say I think the British historical canon has, has thrived on um, positioning on the, on erasure. It, it's derived on erasure, and I guess um, in terms of embracing that history in, in its fullest sense, it does need to think about the things that make up that historical canon, you know, not this kind of nostalgic erasure that has always transpired. And I think part of that, um, or a narrative that has suited that, is has positioned black and ethnic and indigenous people as always oppressed um, or being in some form of subordination or enslavement. And as, you, as you've mentioned, and as the amazing Claire's mentioned, there are so many stories and rich histories in terms of our contribution to not only domestic society, but global society. So I think sitting in that and recognising some of the uncomfortabilities and what people have done to traverse those spaces in spite of the kind of... The, the, the horrors that have been experienced I think is really important and sitting with that uncomfortability is also I think an, an essential part because I think part of not wanting to engage with that is the uncomfortability of oh it's a bit it's a bit sticky and then the fragility kind of kicks in and then before you know it you're managing the entire discourse it's about really embracing it in its fullest kind of warts and all and Britain does have a past that is problematic and it needs to recognise that um, and I think you know that is an important part in terms of moving forward and also recognising the entirety of the historical his, historic British canon. And there we must end. I know there must be so many more questions that you might want to ask and certainly get answered. Um, hopefully we may be able to get these two incredible, <laughs> incredible people back here again. You the are incredible that. as well, That's Darren. Nice. You know, yeah, like much, assistant <laughs> editor of Daily Mirror. I, I will just say this very quickly. Um, uh,
this is a starting point for a discussion. You will never ever get any discussion uh, on race folded neatly into a box with a nice bow on the top. There is too much hurt, too much history, too much trauma, too much day-to-day -day lived experience, and too much un unquantifiable, uh, too many unquantifiable elements connected with it. So the antidote to that is to learn, to read, to listen, to talk, and to ensure that we all, regardless of our level of experience, demographic, place that we live in the country, we keep on learning, not just from people who look like us, but from people who don't look like us, so that together we can make strides and maybe come back here and share that learning. With that, I want to say thank you to Jason Arde. You should have said Professor Jason Arde, sorry, and Dr. Claire. And also to you. Thank you very much indeed.